Ever feel like you're doing this teaching thing alone? You don't have to be. Share Teaching is all about sharing the workload through the power of collaboration and teamwork. Together, we'll walk through all the difficult parts of teaching and learn how to streamline our processes, fine tune our time management, and develop a more manageable workload. If that sounds like a dream come true to you, then welcome to the Shared Teaching Podcast. Let's share in the teaching to make those dreams a reality. Now here's today's Shared Teaching. Hello and welcome back to the Shared Teaching Podcast. You are listening to episode number 68, where I sit down and have a very candid interview with Jamie Sears, founder of Not So Wimpy Teacher and first-time author of How to Love Teaching Again. In Jamie's book, she is giving us many strategies that we can implement to not only fall in love with teaching again, but to stay in the profession. Jamie has been a longtime mentor of many teachers, myself included, and her no-nonsense tips and strategies are so helpful that you're not going to want to miss today's episode. So I give you Jamie Sears. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. You are welcome. I am super excited. So you have written a new book called How to Love Teaching Again. And at the time people are listening to this podcast, it will have been out for one day, which is super (laughs) exciting. (laughs) Yay, it's it's one day birthday, (laughs) right? Can you tell uh, my listeners a little bit about what made you want to write this book and tell your story? Yeah, I wanted to be an author when I was a little girl. I remember being in third grade and sitting up against the wall at recess writing books. And so I always had this thought in my head that I wanted to be an author, but I didn't know what I wanted to write until it was uh, 2019 and I was sitting there and I just, it popped into my head that I really needed to to write this book, How to Love Teaching Again. There's so many teachers already who were leaving the classroom and that was before the pandemic. And the thing is, if you really just realize teaching is not for you and so you leave, that's one thing. But I was hearing these stories of teachers in my community who who were thinking they were going to be a teacher for life. They had been dreaming about being a teacher since they were young. And now they were so upset to find out that it wasn't like they thought. And I just wanted to help in some way to keep teachers who really want to be in the classroom in the classroom. And I... I am, I've always had a bit of a talent for systemizing things and making things simple. That's always been sort of my, my strong point. I thought I am going to share the strategies I used in the classroom to make teaching more manageable and more fun in hopes that it will help other teachers who may be reaching their breaking point close to burnout. Very true. And especially now I am hearing so many stories, even I'm a full-time teacher. So a lot of my colleagues are also saying the same thing, like, I don't know if I can do another year. So I think your book is very timely and of course, very much needed right now. So, Absolutely. I I feel like this is when the pandemic happened was when I was writing my book and I really was thinking, we need to get this out faster. There's so many things in the world of education that I can't fix in a book. Um, there's so many things and teachers shouldn't be asked to fix. The, right. the state of education, we need voters to fix. We need politicians, administrators. We need help fixing the system. But if we wait until the system gets fixed, so many fantastic teachers will be long gone. And so I'm hopeful that taking some of these strategies from this book could help you to find the joy in teaching that you probably had at one point or another. And I'm hopeful that it will help to keep some of our best educators in the classroom. And I'm going to continue to use my voice and my vote because we got to make some changes in the world of education. Absolutely, as you should. And you come from a very unique background to help kind of spearhead how we can make these changes. So did you want to talk a little bit about that? 
my first career was actually as a lobbyist at the state Supreme Court level, and I loved being a lobbyist. I have a, a deep love for politics. Not not many people can say that, right. I realize. <laughs> And I just, I loved it. And being a lobbyist meant that I had, I got to research law that was uh, being proposed and I got to help legislators to understand the pros and cons of different legislation. And so I do have a love for politics and I know that at the heart of it, We need politicians to start funding schools differently. We need politicians to stop adding more testing to our docket. There's so many ways in which our local, state, and federal politicians can help make changes in education that are desperately needed to keep teachers in the classroom and to benefit our students who do not need another test and do not need to be in a classroom with 30 other students. They need smaller classroom sizes, which comes with better funding. All four, especially as we're looking up at another round of spring testing season. (laughs) And my state, they have a bill going through right now to add an additional test to high schoolers before they're allowed to graduate because they think it'll make the high school diploma more valuable. And I'm over here thinking they put in 13 years of passing test after test after test after test. There is no need for one more test. One more test won't improve education. So I've got to get my voice out there. And I need others to help me to get the voice out there, tell the legislators what's truly needed to help in these classrooms. But in the meantime, I feel like let's strategize, let's systemize some things so that you can find some joy tomorrow in the classroom. Absolutely. And one of the things you talked about in your book, and you said it might be a little bit polarizing, was about grading using a couple different strategies. So I'll let you take on with that. <laughs> grading. Yeah, let's let's talk about grading. Dive and into so, the hard topic. <laughs> oh, yes, let's do it. So grading. I'm going to put this out there. And it, it, it might be polarizing, but I don't think you need to grade every assignment that you give to students. And I know I've been there where I graded way too many assignments. And I think in my head, I'd, it was my head was telling me if you give it to them and they took the time to do it, you should take the time to grade it. Right. We need to get back to thinking about why we grade things. Why are we assessing students? We're assessing to see if they've met a standard. Well, if we've just taught the lesson, it's not time to assess if they've met the standard. First, we need to give them practice time. So some of the assignments we give students are merely to give them the opportunity to practice. Once they've had the opportunity to practice, then we can give a graded assessment. So looking ahead at what assignments you're giving your students in the next couple of weeks, asking yourself, is this for practice or is it time for them to show that they've mastered this this standard? And then this one I get really passionate about. I talk a little bit in the book about things you can maybe not grade, things you can Mm -hmm. grade, but homework. Right. I'm so passionate about homework. First of all, I truly think if you have any say in the matter, and I understand you might not, don't give homework if you can avoid it. Think about homework. It It isn't fair. Every student does not have a parent sitting next to them, helping them through the homework. Some of our students are babysitting younger siblings. Some of our students don't have internet. Some of our students don't have devices to use, or they're shared amongst many siblings. They don't all have quality books to read at home. They don't all have the means to buy a ton of materials to make this fancy science fair board. So whenever we're asking students to do things at home, it's not necessarily accessible to all of our students. But beyond that, if we've just taught something and then we're sending it home, are our students able to complete it independently? Mm -hmm. If they aren't, then we are really asking parents to step in and they don't always have that ability either. And so if you can avoid sending home homework, do that. But if you do have to send home homework, send home something that's a review. Like you've taught it a while ago and have had time to practice it in class so they are more independent at home, but also consider not Grading homework assignments because you truly don't know who had the parent sitting next to them supporting, who had the parent sitting next to them doing it, and who took a stab at it all by themselves independently. This will save you a ton of time and stress. 
Very true. And I am one that just gives a class dojo point, like, yep, you turned it in. And then when they leave, it goes in the recycling. (laughs) I love that. So you're rewarding them for completion and not spending the time grading it. I think that's really smart. Right. And also I'm in your boat of what are they allowed to do at home? Who's supporting them? So I try to make it very easy. But then again, you do have a lot of administration that says, Make sure you get homework. So there we yeah. are. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Sometimes you are at the mercy of those decision makers. And so looking at which assignments you send home for homework, is there any way you can send home something that truly is a review, that they've been working on it in class for a while so that they can complete it independently without so much support at home? There's, right. We shouldn't be crying about homework at home. And if you are a parent, you have probably had your child cry about homework, but... Um, you yes. may have cried a few tears yourself <laughs> about their homework. And I feel like there's this is unnecessary. This is not aiding in mastery of the standards. It's truly teaching our children that those eight hours they put in at school, seven or eight hours they put in at school was just not enough. You have to come home and you have to do more. Well, as teachers, I'm trying to tell teachers to understand that being a great teacher doesn't mean working more. But we have been in, that has been ingrained in us since we were small children and we went to school for seven or eight hours and we had to go home and do more. I want to encourage children to join the soccer team or go play at the park or have dinner with their family, play with pets. These are things that children learn from as well. It's a different type of lesson than math facts, but probably a life lesson that's going to have much greater value to them. Very true. So in your book, you also talked about batching lesson plans to help decide um, how we can work a little bit less. And yeah. you were a big fan of a planner, <laughs> which you reference quite often in your book, which was fun yes. and very relatable. And I have many that pile up that I don't even fill out. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. It's all right. So uh, let's talk I, about lessons. How, yeah, let's how talk about lesson time. time. Lesson planning, it can take so much of a teacher's time other than grading. I think lesson plan is, planning is one of those time suckers for us. We're wanting to get the best lessons possible for our students. And sometimes we can spend a considerable amount of time planning for them. So I do, I'm a huge proponent of batch your lesson plans. And batching, what that means is you're doing like tasks all at once instead of spreading them out because As you switch tasks, it takes your brain a lot of time to get back into the flow. A lot of time and energy is wasted in task switching. So when it comes to lesson planning, this looks like maybe you teach all subject areas. And so you sit down on Friday and you're lesson planning for reading and writing and math and science and social studies. Those are all different tasks. They require different materials and really a different thought process. So you waste a lot of time just getting out the materials. And then you start to lesson plan. It's usually hard at first, right? You're like, I don't know. What are we going to do Monday? Wait, what? And after a day or two, you get through Monday's plans. Maybe you're into Tuesday. It starts to flow. Your head gets in the flow and you start it starts to get easier. But then guess what? You're like, okay, done with this week's reading plans. Now I got to switch to math. Mm-hmm. Completely changing what you're doing. And so your brain has started all over. It's tough again. I figure out where are we at in math? And now we're not in the flow. And so batching your lesson plans is when you take the time to create maybe five weeks of reading plans in one sitting. Instead of one week of five different subjects, you're creating five weeks of one subject. Once your brain gets into the flow of creating reading plans or math plans or science plans, now you stay there in that flow and create weeks worth of plans instead of just one. This is a huge time saver. It's not easy to get started. I want to be right. real honest with you. Not easy to get started once you get that system in place and you get going, you're going to be in love with how much time you save. You brought up planners. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm a planner addict. I love to get a new planner. Um, it's fun when they come in the mail and I like to give them a good sniff because everyone knows that books smell good. Yes. They but do. as teachers, we tend to, we lesson plan for our students. So we plan like Every minute of their instructional day down to, I mean, down to the minute, you know what you're doing at 942 on Monday right. morning. Just know we don't plan our plan time like we plan their time. And when I talk about plan time, 
some teachers will be like, I don't have a plan, period. I, I'm sorry, because you ought to. Right. But even if you don't have a planned period, you're planning at some point. Your plan time can be your before school time, your after school time. Some of you, it's your lunch time. Whatever time it is you choose to do your lesson planning, your grading, answering email, these types of tasks. We often don't plan out that time. Right. We make a huge to-do list. We're awesome at making to-do lists, right? Oh, we absolutely are. <laughs> and the to-do list is overwhelming. So a lot of times you come... You take your kids out to the parking lot, say goodbye to them. You come back in your classroom and you're like, okay, what do I do now? Because you don't have a plan. So you look at that huge to-do list and it's like, oh, I'm never going to get this done. So you don't do any of it, right? Because it's just overwhelming. Yes. And those are the days where I'm like, I'm just going home now. (laughs) I can't hack it. I'm I'm out. (laughs) Or you just pick the easiest thing because you're tired. So you're like, I'm just going to pick the easiest thing on this list, which may not be the highest priority item, right? And then you get distracted. You start doing that, but then but then you remember something else. So you head over here. And, and at the end of the day, when you go to home, you don't feel like you were productive because you can't cross things off of that to-do list. So I have a strategy in the book that I go into great detail about, but really it's using that calendar to plan out when you are going to complete micro tasks. And so this is taking that task and breaking it down into smaller pieces and putting it in a time block in your calendar. So instead of writing work on grading reading tests, we want want to scratch that. We're not going to work on grading reading tests. Because if we do that, we don't know. like When can we feel good about it? Does every reading test have to be graded before we feel good, before we get to celebrate? Our brain is going to say yes. So if you don't get them all graded, you will go home thinking you failed, even if you did great work. So instead, we're going to look at our time blocks and we're going to say, okay, maybe you only have from 3.30 to 4 because at 4 o'clock you have a meeting. So you've got 30 minutes. You're not going to get all your reading tests graded in 30 minutes. Well, how many do you want to get graded in those 30 minutes? Maybe it's six. So on your calendar, you're going to write grade six reading tests, not work on grading reading tests. You're going to write grade six. When you finish grading that sixth reading test, you will know that you get to celebrate because you completed exactly what you were supposed to complete during that time block. And you'll have to you'll have to find another time block to add in some more reading tests. But this allows you to feel productive with what you are doing during your plan time. It will cut down the amount of time you spend working at school or the amount of work you take home with you because you're going to start with those priority tasks. Which makes a lot of sense because the more focused you are, the more clarity you have, the more you get done. <laughs> yes. And if you if you put it in your plan, just like you put math into your lesson plans or a meeting into your plans, then you're going to do it. It's like you're making a meeting with yourself. At 3.30, I have a meeting with myself to grade six reading tests, which means I'm going to have to choose not to go chat with my bestie about what happened in class today because I have a meeting at 3.30 with myself. And then you leave. If you leave at four o'clock, you're like, I graded those six reading tests. Instead of feeling bad, like I only graded six, you're like, I graded six because that's all you plan to do. It was a much more realistic plan than the huge to-do list where you didn't know where to start. Which I think will also cut down on us beating ourselves up because we didn't get all the grading done. So yeah, beating yourself up is exactly what a lot of teachers are doing because a lot of teachers are already amazing educators, but they don't even realize it. And sometimes it just comes down to how they're defining what success is. If finishing the to-do list is success for you, then yeah, you're never going to feel successful because that to-do list will grow faster than you can attack it. Very true. So this kind of goes very well with what you talked a lot about in the book as well with setting boundaries. <laughs> I Like when you hear that word, like it still right? kind of makes me a little like <laughs> uneasy. Boundaries always sounded negative to me. And it took me a long time, a lot of thinking about why is it so negative for someone to have boundaries? And the realization was... I was used to other people having boundaries and I needed to live within their boundaries. I didn't have my own boundaries yet. So if you hear the word boundaries and it kind of gives you the little heebie-jeebies, you might be defining yeah, saying it made me a little like, uh. oh, <laughs> it's not a bad word. So if you need right. to replace it, you know, like the book Frindle where they don't call a pen a pen, go on, change the word to whatever you want it to be. But a boundary, 
Think about it this way. It's your permission to say no. Boundaries are permission to say no. When you hear it like that, it's like, well, awesome. That sounds great. I want the permission to say no. Who doesn't? But we have trouble establishing them and we have trouble mm-hmm. communicating them. And sometimes I think you just need permission, permission to establish a boundary. For example, I'd love for your listeners to establish the boundary of, I am not going to check or respond to work emails after my contracted time each weekday or on weekends. Yes. Put it out of office on your email. And I'm telling you, people will get used to it. It will be okay. At first, it's like, ah, I could never do this. Put it out of office that says something uh, like, Hi, your email is so important to me, but I am spending time with my family right now. I will get back to you during the next business day or within, you know, 24 hours, something like that. Which is a really nice way to put it. Yeah. And you know what? We're used to that. There's so many businesses that we're not going to get a response immediately from. We are used to that as human beings. And so when we get your out of office response, we will start to actually get used to it. Parents can still email you any time of night and that's fine. I have to email teachers when I think about it because I got to get it off my brain. But you don't have to know about it until your work hours. So remove your work email from your personal phone, your device. Make it hard to check your email so that you are not tempted to check it when you are not working. Because even if you're like, I'm not working, I'm just going to see what my email looks like. Right. an email there from a principal or a parent, it can steal your joy Maybe a parent is complaining about something and you're like, wait, that's not true. That's not how it happened. I don't know if you've ever done this, but I'll do it to my spouse. I'll be like, that's not how it happened. And I tell him like five times how it really happened to the point. He's like, I get it. I get it. Well, it fuels you. And you did make that point in the book where you kind of like ruminate on it over the weekend. Mm -hmm. If you checked your email and then it ruins everything. Yeah. You can't stop thinking about it. So by the time you get to work on Monday, you've already gone through the whole situation so many times and it is still, it stole your time. It stole your weekend joy. Wait till you get to work and handle work at work. And so put the out of office on and remove it from your device. And this goes for if you use things like Dojo or another classroom communication, remove that from your phone if you can too, because you are not required to respond to Dojo the moment a parent posts a question. Allow them to post questions whenever they want, but make it clear when you will respond will be during your contracted work hours. This is more than reasonable. We don't expect a doctor to call us during non-business hours. Right. I mean, it'd be great, but we know that's not (laughs) how it works. And so we're used to that. They have people for that. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) but we're used to that. And then uh, some teachers will be like, but what if, what if there's an emergency? Your principal has your phone number. Your your teacher bestie has your phone number. If there's a true emergency, they can call you. And I would always even put in my email signature down at the bottom underneath my name. I respond to emails Monday through Friday from 7 to 4. If you email me at another time, I will get back to you at my earliest convenience. Oh, people that's a good get, idea. Yeah, people get used to this. When they see it, you have established a boundary and it's perfectly reasonable boundary so people will respect it as long as you respect it if you start emailing them back on the weekends guess what they will email you even more that boundary is broken very true and definitely set that up at the beginning of the school year. Mm-hmm. Yep. Because <laughs> it's but, hard to switch if you've already yeah. been doing it. <laughs> yep, that's true. Stick with it. All right. So is there anything that we haven't covered that you really want to make sure that my listeners know? You know, I think a really cool strategy I talk about in the book could be helpful this time of school year too, is that sometimes our love for teaching is a little hampered because we don't feel like we're good at teaching a certain subject. We have that one subject that we just want to pull our hair out. We don't know how to do it. We don't feel like we're doing a good job. For me, it was writing, which is crazy because I wanted to be a writer. I love writing. And so when I became a teacher, I thought, oh my gosh, my kids are going to love writing. This will be such a fun time. We're going to write so many things together. And then my students came in and guess what? I hated writing. And I was like, what? Why do you hate writing? It's so great. It's almost hard for me to understand where they're coming from. I realized 
that my liking writing is not the same as my being a great writing teacher who can help my students to love writing and to get better and better. And I was struggling to the point that I would purposely let math and reading run long so that I didn't have to teach writing. I'd be like, oh no, we ran out of time. We're not going to be able to do writing today. Nah, tomorrow, guys, tomorrow. But I, I got to this point where I thought if I'm dreading teaching a certain subject, I'm not going to love my job because I got to teach that subject and it's going to keep coming back day after day after day. Right. But I loved teaching math and I was like, I feel like I'm a pretty good math teacher. I really like it. This is no time to be humble teachers. I really want you to think what's that subject you're super good at. And then Start jotting down all the reasons you think you do a good job at that subject. What are you doing when you teach that subject that you think is helping students to perform better? So for math, I started to write down, well, I do small groups. I I break up my instruction into units of study instead of just like bouncing all over the place. I give students choice. And I just, I have this great list of things. Mm -hmm. Now I ask myself, which of these items could, could I carry over to writing? Because I'm not doing as well over there. Now, everything didn't carry over. And that's right. okay. Like, I use manipulatives in math. Well, in writing, you know, pulling out, the, you know, pulling out the shape blocks, it is, it's not going to work. But there were lots that carried over. The small group idea, I was like, huh, I use small groups in reading and math. It really does help to differentiate. But in writing, all of a sudden, I just have them sitting at their desks all the time while I come to them individually, which takes too much time. Maybe I should have some small groups in writing. And it was like this aha moment, like, that could really help. What about choice? I was telling them like, this week we're writing a report about an animal. Next week we're writing a letter to the president. You know, I was telling them exactly what to write out to the point where I'd be like, okay, remember in the first paragraph, you need to write about these things. All the writing even sounded the same. No wonder I hated it. Right. So I started to get more choice, choice in topics, choice in writing utensils. Whoa. I started to like writing even more. In fact, it became one of my favorite subjects over time. And it was all about learning how to fall in love with that subject that you have been dreading. So I hope that that strategy will help another teacher to look at at her day. It could be maybe you feel amazing at reading, but not so great at math. Try this strategy and see if you can come up with some things new to try in your dreaded subject area. Be bold and willing to try something new, even if your teacher next door isn't doing it the same way. I oh, such an important part. Yes. <laughs> I feel like we learn how to teach by watching those around us. And that's fabulous. So much to learn. But then we get it in our head that this is the only way to teach. And you are your own individual and your students are different. So lean into teaching the way that, that works for your students and works for you. And you are going to be more in love with the profession when you learn that it's okay to do something different, to try out new ideas. And you might be surprised. The teacher next door might come knocking on your door going, what are you doing over here? Because what you see on the outside or front stage might be masking some things going on the backstage. You might think it's going amazing across the hall only to find out they have their challenges too because none of us are perfect. Yes, very true. And I like that you brought that up because there's so much comparison. And I think that is also where we start burning out is we're too much Pinterest and social media. And we don't see what you said is the backstage of all the other things that are happening. Yes, people don't put that on their social media. They might tell you about the (laughs) amazing room transformation they did in reading, but they didn't tell you that their math lesson flopped. They don't tell you that their classroom management is struggling or that they stayed up until 2 a.m. getting ready for that activity. So be careful. Keep your eye on your own paper. That's what we tell our students. Right. We can tell you that too, (laughs) that it's fine to look around to get ideas, but maybe be really careful on what you choose to implement in your classroom, not feeling like it has to be just like the teacher. But if you're struggling um, with teaching math and you know the teacher next door loves to teach math, cool, take some lessons from them about how they are preparing their lessons. But maybe you see some other things online and you say, you know, it looks great, but I am going to say no for right now because I don't have the bandwidth to do Mm -hmm. all of these new things right now. Maybe, maybe I'll try it next year, but there's always going to be this like new trendy thing that you're going to see online. And I want to just challenge you to pass on most of them and just do the ones that really, truly light you up 
and that you have space on your calendar to implement. Yes. And I'll hop in and say that when I started doing some of those things and ignoring the stuff that's going on in the other rooms near me, I became more happy with what was happening in my own classroom. Yeah. You start to see that you're doing pretty great things in your own classroom. If your definition of success is to be just like the teacher next door or just like the teacher you saw on Instagram, you're always going to be let down because that's so incredibly challenging. But when you say, you know what, I'm not going to do those things. I'm just going to close the door and do my thing. You start to go, me, my, my thing might be working. Right. <laughs> and that, that's when I think you start to really love what you do is when you give yourself some credit for the awesomeness that's already happening in your classroom. Right. So I think your book, um, just giving teachers the permission to set those boundaries, find what they love about themselves and their students is really what's going to make all the difference. So thank you so much for coming up with this book that's so needed. And again, it's called How to Love Teaching Again. So where can my listeners find more about not only the book, but you as well, if they want to get in touch? You can find me at notsowimpyteacher.com. And then we're on Facebook and Instagram as Not So Wimpy Teacher. You can find the book anywhere you purchase books, uh, Target, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. But there's also a link on my website. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I've loved having this conversation with you. And thank you so much you for having me. Success. Absolutely. Anytime. <laughs> Anytime. Thank you and have a great rest of your day. If you've loved this show, then join me in sharing the teaching, hitting that subscribe button, and leaving us a review on iTunes so we can be found by more teachers like you who are ready to start sharing the workload. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Find new episodes each week on shareteaching.com. Thanks for listening to the Share Teaching Podcast.